My name is Chris Walker. It's good to be here with you again. Um, and uh, oh, it's, it's warming up a bit. I was a bit cold. But, um, uh, we're continuing our series on the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So uh, what we're doing at the moment is, some, is a mini-series on I am. So I am power. I am prophet. And this morning I'm going to be talking about I am life. We're going to be talking about walking by the Spirit and living out the life of God that God has put in us. Okay. Without further ado, let's plunge straight in. Um, Romans 6, 4 talks about this new life. It says, uh, you know, we were therefore buried with him, that's with Christ, through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Uh, I am life, a new life. And in, uh, in Romans 7 and 8, this new life starts being described in terms of the Spirit. So look carefully at this. When we were in the realm, or when we were in the realm of the flesh, we'll come back to that, uh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we've been released from the law so that we serve, here we are, in the new way, this new life. But it's of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who uh, is involved in this new life, not in the old way of the written code. And increasingly, when we move to Romans 8, the emphasis on the, is, is on the Spirit as the giver of this new life. Uh, in Romans 8, 5 to 8, those... Oops, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed or since the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. If we were to notice from Romans 7 and Romans 8, but he was, Paul was talking there about two spheres of life, two realms of existence. One he called flesh and one he called spirit. And I've got my daughter to help me with uh, a little diagram here. I was trying to do it for about half an hour. And then uh, Bethany came in and goes, oh. And then Matthew came in, oh, Dad. And uh, within 10 seconds, they'd done it. And to my, it's not one of my gift things. But uh, we've got these two spheres of existence. The sphere on the left is called flesh. Remember Paul said, when we were in the flesh, but you are not in the flesh. So this is not something that Christians are in now. And on the right we have spirit. So to be in the flesh is to be apart from Christ and the spirit. It's not to have Christ and the spirit. It's to be an unbeliever, as it were. Uh, he, he talks about our minds being hostile to God and unable to please God. Whereas when we come to Christ, when we're in the spirit, we have Christ and the spirit. The Bible talks about our minds being renewed, Romans 12, and uh, being able to, to please God. Now, you, you may be here, and you may not be a believer, and let me say you're very, very welcome. Uh, we love it when people come and, and check us out, and, uh, and you are, you're welcome to come as long as you want, and there's no require. What's going on? Oh, thank you very much. Marvellous. I can look there instead of there. Ah, that's good. Thank you. I'll just look down now. Just... <laughs> you want me to stand <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But if, if you're here and you're not a believer, you're very welcome. And you might think, well, how am I hostile to God? How, how, why am I not pleasing God? And the, the answer is, is, is one thing, it's sin. It's a problem that we've all had and continue to have. Because God is a holy God and, and we have sin. And that sin bars us from his presence. And you might say, well, what has he done about that? Well, he sent his son to die for us 2,000 years ago on a cross. He paid the price for our sin and took all the sin of the world on himself. But it's not automatically applied to us. We have to get in on it by trusting in him, making a decision to give our lives to him and follow him. And then he gives us his spirit, and his spirit applies everything that Jesus has done on the cross to us. So we move from flesh, the sphere of flesh, into the sphere of spirit when we do that. Romans um, 5 and 6 talk about it slightly differently, but it's the same thing. Okay, so on the line on the, on the left, we were in Adam, which is the same as being in the flesh. It's not to have Christ in the spirit. And then there was a point in time when we moved from, if you like, the, the left to the right. That's when we became converted. We move out of Adam into Christ. We move out of the flesh into the spirit, a different realm. And everything we do, once we become a believer, everything we do, we do on that right-hand line. We're in a new sphere. We're in a new line. We're in Christ, not in Adam. We're in the spirit, not in the flesh. When we sin, we don't slip back to the, the left-hand line. If you sin, you, you, everything you do, you do in Christ on the right-hand line. And eventually, the left-hand sphere or age will disappear. It will disappear. And what will happen, the right hand just carries on and on and on for eternity. So we've crossed over from being in Adam to being in Christ, from being in the sphere of the flesh to being in the sphere of the spirit. Now, what does this new life, this new sphere, what does life in this new sphere look like? Well, Paul talks about this in Galatians. I was slipping over to Galatians, even though that wasn't my text. But <laughs> well, that's fine. I can only get sacked. But Paul says that if you're in this, this sphere of the flesh, this, this sphere of life outside of Christ and the Spirit, then these are the, the, the things that characterize that. It's a, almost a lifestyle. And you can see them there. There are 15 sins there. Um, eight, we always think, oh, it must be to do with, with if it's, it's, must be to do with sexual immorality or everything. But only three of them are, are to do with sexual immorality. Some idolatry. But eight of, eight of the 15 are to do with, with sins of discord, if you like. There was, there was, uh, dissension in the community in fact in Galatians uh, 5 15 he says you Galatians you're eating and devouring one another and uh, this is what Paul says you're not in the sphere of the flesh anymore why are you acting as if you were uh, you don't need to be characterized by this you need to be characterized by the things on the right because that's what life in the spirit looks like you know these love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, what we call the nine fruits of the Spirit. But then in, in Colossians, he lists five more. There's not an exhaustive list. In Colossians, he lists five more. Two of them are new. Three of them are from the Galatians list. He adds in compassion, and he adds in humility. And this is what life in the Spirit should look like, should be characterized by. All of these, elsewhere in, in Scripture, are used to describe the character of Jesus. Right? Or the Father. So what we're saying here is that the Holy Spirit wants to bring the same characteristics that characterize the character of Christ or the Father and recreate them in us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We'll, we'll say more about that in a minute. Now, on the right-hand sphere, you may say, well, I'm, an, I'm, I'm, I'm not a believer. You've told me I'm welcome, and you're very welcome. I can do some of those things. Yes, you can. And believe me, some Christians can do some things on the left. <laughs> well, the Galatians were. But 
we're talking about our lifestyle being characterized by these things. We're not talking about an occasional lapse. We're talking about persisting in these sins. And Paul is saying, you are in the flesh, so do not live, sorry, you are not in the flesh. So do not live according to the flesh, according to the standards and values and behavior of that old sphere. Because you're not in it anymore. You're in the sphere of the spirit. So live according to the spirit. Let your conduct, let your lifestyle be characterized by these things. Let God bring them, these fruits, let him bring them to fruition, as it were, in you, in your life. Now, I race through that because I want to get to talk about walking in the spirit. Let me say this to you. It's good news. Perfection is not envisaged. <laughs> okay. We know that because immediately in Galatians 6 verse 1, after saying all of that, he says, Brothers and sisters, if you are caught in a sin, then you who are spirit people, you who are pneumatic or you who live by the spirit, what you need to do is restore that person gently. But also watch yourselves in case you're tempted as well. I've, I've put in bold, gently, because that's one of the fruits of the Spirit that he just mentioned in Galatians 5. So there's an example of what walking in the, in the fruit of these, the, um, in the fruit of the Spirit, what it looks like. You gently, with, with the Spirit's fruit of gentleness, restore the person that's fallen. Note 2, another verse, Galatians 5.16. This is the one we're going to major on. I say this to you, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You know that there's a promise in there? If you walk by the Spirit, God promises you that you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's, the two are mutually incompatible. So if you're struggling with something, a particular sin that was on that left-hand side, not an occasional lapse, but you're struggling a bit more than that, God says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The key is walking by the Spirit. So I want to talk now for the rest of our time this morning about walking by the Spirit, because that's the key to life, that, appropriating the new life that God has given us. Walk by the Spirit. Okay. Walk is a very, uh, it's a primary metaphor in the Old Testament for behavior, for conduct, for how we live. Um, it talked about walking in the paths of the Lord. Lead me in, in paths of righteousness, the psalmist says in Psalm 23. It's all about how we live. Walking in the law of the Lord, or um, when it's not walking as we're meant to walk, it's walking in the sins of Jeroboam and bad kings and places like that. But walk is, is a key metaphor for how we live, for our conduct, for ethical conduct, as it were. Walk is important. Um, and in the New Testament, this is the word that Paul picks up, walk, 17 times, in fact. It's not often translated walk in the NIV. Sometimes they translate it live, and, and there's good reasons for that. We once had a house group where we, we just look, we spent the evening looking up all 17 references. It was, it was great fun. And uh, just, just going through that. And uh... Sorry? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't in this church. <laughs> well, what do you do in your house group? Okay, don't answer that. I just memo to Tom and Leslie. <laughs> but there are 17 instances where Paul talks about walking, walking. And the most important is walk by the Spirit. Um, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. 17 times in Paul. Now... And note this marvelous synergy, human-divine synergy, coming together. We walk, but it's by the Spirit. So it's, it's a, it's a human-divine combination. We walk by the Spirit. Human walking, empowered by the Spirit. It's a 
this divine human divine synergy now how do we do this this is the bit you want to hear I don't know no no I've got I've got I've got some I've got a few thoughts for you for what they're worth they they may help you they may not help you but um, we'll see I've got five observations for you, and these are, these are the bits that I want to major on. I'll just take my watch off so I know. I can check my time. Okay. Some of this might sound a bit obvious, but it's, I can assure you there's deep meaning in it. Okay. <laughs> it's walking, not standing. And it needs to be learnt. I'll say that again. It's walking, not standing, and it needs to be learnt. Now, how do we do this? Well, I think the metaphor, walking, is the place to begin. So, it's not just about standing in the spirit. We often think, if I just stand, like this, and say, God, do it. That's not walking in the spirit. Because I have to do the walking. God, the Holy Spirit won't walk for you. But we often think, I'll stand and I'll go, God, do it, do it, do it. But nothing will happen. <laughs> because Walking is what we have to do, not what the Holy Spirit does. I told you this is a simple, but this is, there's a lot of truth in this. Walking involves effort and action and behavior on our part. It relates to everything that we are and do. We have to walk. And how do we do this? Well, to continue the metaphor, we walk by placing one foot in front of the other but trusting the Spirit to guide our steps and strengthen us and empower us because so often we're weak in our walking. But it's walking by the Spirit. But it requires action, not standing. It's action on our part requiring obedience and effort. There was a very uh, famous book by um, Eugene Peterson who just recently passed away. Who's the translator of the Message Bible? Uh, this is about oh, 25 years ago. Talked about the long obedience in the same direction. And uh, it was about discipleship in an instant society. Well, that was, that was a, a while ago. It's, it's a very prophetic book, actually, because it's, it's, it's very much the case now. And he said people don't want to be pilgrims anymore, they want to be tourists in the church. And we're talking about a long obedience in the same direction, walking by the Spirit. And as I said, we have to learn how to do it. We don't get born with an instant maturity in this, just as we, we don't when we're a child, we don't when we're a Christian. A baby doesn't come out of the womb knowing how to walk and being able to walk from that moment in time. The baby has to learn to walk. Now, I'm a, a, I'm a grandfather now, and uh, Jenny is a, a you nanny, Nana Jen? Nana Jen, sorry, Nana Jen. Well, I'm Granddad, Granddad Wally, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Amy and Justin uh, have had a baby called uh, Josiah. They haven't been for a while, have they left? <laughs> no, sorry. No. Scrub that. <laughs> They'll be here soon. But uh, Josiah doesn't know how to walk yet. He's just this bundle of uh, Googleness and uh, Googles around, and just uh, you pick him up, and he has, you have to do everything for him. He, you know, he doesn't know how to walk. Um, his parents are going to have to teach him and help him um, to walk. Unfortunately, Josiah, my grandson, was not one of the privileged few, who was born a walker. <laughs> <laughs> of 
Gordon, my brother. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, as am I. Our wives have taken our surnames, but they're like Gentiles coming in on the promises that were given to Israel. <laughs> well, she's look, not looking very happy. <laughs> I now know how Tom feels. <laughs> uh, but Josiah is going to have to learn how to walk. And so it is with walking in the Spirit. When we become a Christian, we need to learn how to walk by the Spirit. Now, we need to cultivate our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Do you remember last time when I spoke? Well, you may not, but um, I did quite a lot on the fact that the Holy Spirit is not in it, but he's a person. And we need to cultivate a relationship with that person. As I said, this, this, this is obvious stuff, but it's quite profound. We need to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm married to Jenny. Been married 30 years now. And um, we have to spend time. We don't, no, sorry, we don't have to spend time. We choose to spend time with each other <laughs> in each other's presence, listening to each other, talking to each other. And we have to do the same with the Holy Spirit. We were talking at house group this week and um, someone said they found it very helpful, Tom's suggestion to set a time on your phone because we need to build into our schedule time to have our relationship with the Holy Spirit, time to cultivate our time with God. Have you got that built into your week? It's not oh, when I feel like it or when I can fit it in and everything else takes priority. We need to have that time scheduled into our week when we cultivate our relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm quite fortunate in one way in that I drive to Sittingbourne every day, hour and a quarter each way. So that's two and a half hours driving time. And that's my time for praying and talking. If I didn't have that two and a half hours a day, I don't, by the way, I don't pray for two and a half hours a day. Just, just say, so you know, in case you thought I was Tom Thompson or something like that, I, 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 I'm not. Um, but it's, that's my time when I know that I can be with God. And if I didn't have that time, I'd have to, to schedule in some other time in the week when I know that I can do it. Um, if, you, if you don't have that scheduled in, if you don't have that time when you're cultivating your relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to struggle to walk by the Spirit. So if you don't, may I make a suggestion to you? Five minutes a week is a good place to start. Now you might think that's not enough, but if you start with five minutes a week, you think, well, I'm doing this, then you can do five minutes maybe a year, three days a week. And then eventually you might get up to five minutes a day and then you can go, but start, you know, don't start by saying I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning and have two hours reading my Bible and praying and you do it for the first day, then it never happens after that. It's, it's just, you know, we've all done, well, we haven't, we, we've all set goals that sounded good. We never achieved them. So I remember um, Ray Lowe um, suggesting five minutes a week and uh, and I know that people have found that helpful. So set yourself meaningful goals. Hit them and then increase them. But build into your week times when you can cultivate your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because the, the, the verses that, that Paul talks about are all about cultivating a relationship with a person. We've already looked at walk by the Spirit and that's what we're doing. But to be led by the Spirit, again, it's a person. To follow the per that person's leading, you need to spend time with them, time in their presence listening to them. Bear the fruit of the Spirit we've mentioned. In Galatians 5, he said, now you've come to life by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. It's all about that relationship. Spending time with the Holy Spirit. Sowing to the Spirit, he says in uh, Galatians 6, and then reaping back from the Spirit. Sow to the Spirit, reap back from the Spirit. 
and not grieving the spirit because he's a person capable of being grieved. Gordon Fee, who is um, probably the major Christian influence in my life um, from his writings and his, his recordings, and uh, he, he, he said, trying to explain this to his students, he said, when you become a Christian, divine perfection doesn't set in. What sets in is divine infection. We get, if you like, we get infected by the person of the Holy Spirit. We need that infection to spread to all parts of our life. We need to receive him, cultivate a relationship with him. Thirdly, we need to avoid introspection. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it means just looking inwards all the time. Back in uh, the, old, the old version of the NIV, to, uh, pre-2011, translated this word flesh as sinful nature. And uh, I just felt at the time when I was writing my dissertation when I was at Spurgeon's, that this was so terrible that I needed to say something about it. And that was in 2009. I said, no, it should be translated sphere of the flesh, uh, not sinful human nature, because there's a perfectly good word for, for nature that Paul uses when he wants to talk about nature. When Paul says, you are not in the flesh, the NIV translated it, you are not controlled by the sinful nature. But it wasn't what Paul was saying. He just says, there's a sphere of existence there. You're no longer in it. That was in 2009. 2011, the NIV came out and changed, changed sinful nature to the sphere of the flesh. And I thought, wow, they've obviously read my dissertation. <laughs> oh, that was a joke, by the way. That was a, um, there are only uh, four people that would have read my dissertation, and one of them is me, and the other three were the ones I had to mark it. <laughs> but, but you... The point is that thinking of the sphere of the flesh as of my sinful nature encourages me to have a bit of introspection and look inwards and, and get to the end of the day sometimes and, and you think, how have I done against some external standard or law? And you mark yourself against the standard or the law. And yet the problem is you never hit the standard or the law. And, and, and rather, at the end of the day, we should give thanks for what God's done in us with his new life and by his spirit and, and ask him for more and, and, and just, just not look inwards. I've, I've said this once before, but if, if your gaze is, is here, you're looking inwards. What you need to do is raise your gaze. Not, not here, looking in, but here. Raise your gaze. Raise your gaze to look at Jesus. Simple, but very effective. Not here, but look at him. Think on him. For instance, think on this. This is the next point. When we walk in the Spirit, we're being conformed into the family likeness. This, I, never, I never fail to be amazed at this. When we walk by the Spirit, we're being conformed into the family likeness that we would all bear the family traits, the family characteristics. And this is what we've been predestined for. This is an amazing verse. For those God foreknew, he's also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Just think about that. You and I have been predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And Jesus is the image of who? The Father. Isn't that amazing? That's what God is doing as we walk by the Spirit. It's the family likeness being recreated in us. Isn't that fan I just find that fantastic. I will never tire of, of, of being amazed by that. The family likeness. When we, when we first went to see Josiah, uh, and Jenny and I were driving back from hospital. Jenny turned to me and she said, he's one of ours. And, and what she meant was, she saw the, fam the, the war famous Walker Features <laughs> in Josiah. She could see the family likeness in him. But it's like that with us. The father and the son are recreating in us the family image. Isn't that amazing? We've been predestined 
to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Yeah, and we've given, he's given us the family language to speak. Jesus said, Abba, Father. And by the Spirit in us, the indwelling Spirit within us, we too can cry out, Abba, Father. The family, the family language, as it were. We've joined the family, and we're having the family tr character traits recreated and brought to fruition in us as we walk by the Spirit. By God's grace and mercy, we've become children of God. And the rest of our lives is about growing into all that that means, really. Isn't that wonderful? It's to be children born into God's family who learn to walk by the Spirit in such a way that we increasingly bear the likeness of our parent and our brother Jesus. Remember I said all the fruits of the Spirit are elsewhere used to describe the character of God and the character of Jesus. Well, all except one, self-control. That's not mentioned anywhere, just being honest. But clearly Jesus did exercise a lot of self-control. <laughs> it's just there's no verse that I can find that says, but all the rest of them, compassion, Jesus said, I have compassion on the people, humility. Jesus said, come to me for I'm gentle and humble in heart. You know, they all describe the character of God or Jesus. And God wants to bring to fruition those characteristics in us, the family likeness. Actually, it's so important that that is the basis for every form of mission and outreach that we do. I'll say that again. That, this, what I've just talked about, being conformed in the family likeness, is actually the basis for every form of outreach and mission and ministry that we do. Because if God has recreated in us one of those fruits, which was compassion, you get compassion brought to fruition in you. You have the heart of Christ. And you, you then take it out to the Vineyard English School or the street cafe. You go with the compassion of Christ. Because that's one of the fruits of the Spirit that the Spirit has recreated in you. Isn't that wonderful? Out of the, having the heart of Christ, out of having the characteristics of Christ, we go and we minister and we do the stuff because they're all linked together. We've got God's heart. We have his character. And out of that we go with his compassion, with his gentleness, with his patience. In addition to our five minutes, or however long it is, there's another way we can get conformed into his image, and that's in worship. I mentioned this very briefly last time. Colossians 3.16 has two dimensions for worship. The first one is vertical. By the Spirit, we sing songs about Jesus, back to the Father. Yeah, By the Spirit, we sing songs about Jesus, back to the Father. But there's also... A horizontal dimension because in that worship it says we admonish and teach one another there's a learning as we sing songs about Christ back to the Father if there's good content songs about Christ we're also being admonished and taught and that admonishing and teaching is conforming us into the image of his son so in worship we need to come and be part of the worship now I'm on car park every other week I know who doesn't get here at half ten I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking. <laughs> but we need to be here at half ten because this is an opportunity for admonishing, teaching, and to be conformed into the image. There's other ways, hearing the word and our own times. Cultivating that relationship with Jesus, being conformed into the family likeness. Finally, we walk individually, we walk by the Spirit, but we do not walk alone. Green Day sang a song, <laughs> I was thinking of this, I'm going to get this one in, it's their best song ever, The Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Anyone like it? No? 
Ah, uh, good. Uh, Damien, changed my opinion of you. That's good. <laughs> he's all right. You don't need to worry about Damien now. He's, a, he's all right. It's okay. It's a good song. It's a good song. That's yeah, fine. Um, he says, <laughs> I walk a lonely road. I walk a lonely road, the only one that I've ever known. It's only me. I walk alone. My shadow's the only one that walks beside me. Good song. It's a good song. But that's not true when you're walking by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit individually. No one else can do it for you. But we do not walk alone. It's just like becoming a Christian. We enter the people of God individually. But we enter a people. We become part of a people. A people for his name and for his glory. We enter individually, but you enter and become part of a people. That verse, Galatians 5.16, where it says, Walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That verse is in second person plural. What does that mean? It means it's you plural. Now, we have a disadvantage in English because we have you and we have you. And one can mean singular and one can mean plural. And, and the verbs are exactly the same. We can say walk to one person and we can say walk to a whole group of people. Second, and they're the same. In the Greek, they're not. So when you read, when you read this chapter through, when you read uh, five and, four, five, and six through, or the, the five and six through in Greek, um, you can see that they, and I can do that, but it's over 20 years of learning. That was a long, hard walk. <laughs> and I'm still learning. That was a long walk in the same direction. <laughs> but, but I can see that it's plural. And you can see, you can look that up. You don't even need to do it. You can do it on the computer these days. But he's talking to a community. You together walk by the Spirit. All of these things, all of these fruits presuppose community. We exhibit them as a church together. Um, it's what walking by the Spirit looks like in the, in the sense of a community. In Galatians 6, remember, verse 1, what does walking by the Spirit like? Well, we together, together, a brother has fallen. We, we restore him with the Spirit's fruit of gentleness because we're in this together. We pick the brother up. We don't walk into it. We, we don't walk alone. We pick the brother up, we restore the brother with the Spirit's fruit of gentleness, and we move on together. We can't do this on your own, on our own. We can't walk by the Spirit in isolation. If you're not in a, a small group, you need to be, because you're also needed by that small group as well. We need each other. So those are five suggestions which I hope you might find helpful for walking by the Spirit. Hang on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not working now. Never mind, that doesn't matter. The conclusion, two sides of the same coin. Don't worry. Um, one side of the coin, is, it almost sounds negative. Walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's one side of the coin. But the other side of the coin is this. Walk by the Spirit. Hey. Next. One more. That's it. The other is, if you like, put more positively. Walk by the Spirit. Be conformed and transformed into the family likeness. We walk by the Spirit and get what we have been predestined for. We get the character of God and of Christ coming to fruition in us. And out of that flows everything. Ministry, mission, everything. And all of this is to the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, I commend to you, walk by the Spirit and live out this new life that God has placed in us. Amen.